This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We end today's show in Pakistan, where Shehbaz Sharif was sworn in, in Monday as prime minister for a second time, days after newly elected members of parliament were seated amid protests by lawmakers from the party of ousted and jailed former prime minister Imran Khan. Sharif is expected to form a new government after none of the major parties won a majority of parliamentary seats in February's election. Khan supporters have accused the military of election tampering. On X, the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad congratulated Shabazz on his, quote, assumption of office. Here in the United States, over 30 members of Congress sent an open letter to President Biden asking him to withhold U.S. recognition of the new Pakistani government until a, quote, thorough, transparent and credible investigation of election interference has been conducted, unquote. On Tuesday, U.S. State Department spokesperson Matt Miller was asked to respond to the letter. So a few things. Number one, there was a competitive election in Pakistan. Millions and millions of people made their voices uh, heard. A new government has been formed, and we will, of course, work with that government. At the same time, um, there were reported irregularities. There have been challenges brought by political parties to the results, and we want to see those challenges and those irregularities fully investigated. For more, we're joined in Islamabad by Asim Sajjad Akhtar, associate professor of political economy at Qaeda Azam uh, University in Islamabad. He's also affiliated um, with the Pakistan um, Workers' Party. We thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm, can you say the name of your university? I'm sorry, I mispronounced it. Qaeda Azam University. Ah. Uh, so, Professor Akhtar, can you talk about the National Sele uh, Assembly um, electing Shabazz Sharif as the country's new prime minister, who he is, and what's really taken place in this election? Yeah, Shabazz Sharif, as you just noted in your intro, is a um, the second time prime minister. He was prime minister just most recently. Uh, between with April 22 and uh, the end of uh, his regime with around the end of 23. And he hails from the Sharif family, which is part of the bourgeois old guard, uh, which has been in and out of power for the best part of about 40 years now. Um, and as you also noted in your intro, um, this election was marred, is, is, is a sort of an understatement, um, by, by rigging and, and by vote tampering. And in fact, even after the election results came out, in which uh, Imran Khan's party clearly, by any objective measure, won the most seats, uh, what we saw was a systematic process of changing the outcomes to reduce Imran's votes or seats by about 25 to 30 seats. And Asim, could you explain uh, the PTI and Imran Khan's uh, uh, popularity? I mean, he's been imprisoned. There are multiple cases against him, and yet, all these people voted for independent candidates aligned with him. What explains that? Yeah, well, of course, again, some of your listeners will know that Imran Khan was himself in power, uh, was prime minister between 2018 and 2022. Um, and, you know, both that during that period, uh, prior to that, before that, um, he's appealed in the vein of many, I'd say, you know, strong men, you know, sort of, right of center strongmen around the world in recent, in the, in the last decade or so, to, I think, a, particularly in Pakistan's case, a very young population disaffected with these institutions of formal representative democracy. Um, and I think that that, um, and, and of course, uh, having been jailed and, and in, his, in his supporters' eyes, you know, uh, unjustifiably removed from power in 2022 and replaced by the very same Sharif and also another old part, old family, the Bhuttos, um, that have been in power all intermittently, uh, and of course, all at the behest of Pakistan's preeminent political force, which is the army. Um, I think that combination of factors, a young disaffected population, um, a, a regime, a set of regimes that historically does not deliver, and then underlying structural crises that just get worse. And I think that contributes to Imran Khan's growing popularity. And ask them, explain, uh, you said uh, re regimes have systematically not responded uh, uh, to the needs of, of uh, uh, ordinary Pakistanis, but explain what, what exactly did Imran Khan do uh, uh, for the people, or for that matter, you've written about this, uh, marginal, so-called marginal areas in Pakistan, from Balochistan to Waziristan. What were his policies? 
Yeah, I mean, in practice, in principle, I, that's exactly right. Um, it's not as if Khan's uh, time in power was marked by any major departures. And, and I think the rhetoric that Khan brings uh, and sort of this, this perception that he is an outsider, uh, and that's why I made reference to, I think, many other similar examples around the world, not to mention what you are dealing with in the United States, again, with the renewed appeal of Trumpism after four years of, of Biden's, you know, liberal imperialism. So you have this, you know, cycle, um, and, and Imran Khan was very much part of that cycle in, in a country which is, you know, ravaged by debt, uh, by climate breakdown events. Um, some of your, li your listeners will know it was only less than two years ago that one third of Pakistan was ravaged by floods, 35 million people were displaced from their homes. So Khan didn't really do anything that different. But I think what ended up happening was because he was removed from office prior to his term um, being completed, I think that then reinforced that, that, that already existing sort of sense and perception amongst his supporters um, that, look, he was trying, he was going to get there eventually, he was going to change the system, but he wasn't allowed to do so. And that rhetoric then ratcheted up a further notch with, with this wave of repression against him and his party. So last August, The Intercept revealed the existence of a classified Pakistani cable that outlined how the U.S. State Department had encouraged the Pakistani government to remove former Prime Minister Imran Khan from office in March of 2022, just weeks after Russia had invaded Ukraine. The document stated the U.S. objected to Khan's neutral stance on the war. According to the memo, one State Department official warned Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S. that, quote, all will be forgiven in Washington if Khan is removed. The U.S. official, Assistant Secretary of State Donald Liu, then went on to say, otherwise, I think it will be tough going ahead. Of course, Imran Khan was in Moscow uh, with Putin when um, Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, so talk overall about the significance of U.S. support for Pakistan and how much does it determine what the Pakistani government does or the direction direction it goes in. Yeah, look, I think that there's, and again, this also contributes to this sense amongst Khan supporters. There's a long history. You know, it, Pakistan has been ruled by the military for about half of its existence. And even when generals are not in the seat of government, they are the de facto sort of, in a sense, power that be. Uh, and, you know, three long periods of dictatorship, twice during the Cold War under generals Ayub Khan and Zia ul -Haq, and then under the war on terror regime with General Musharraf, all of these regimes were fully backed by Washington. And so, you know, the fact that, you know, whether or not Imran Khan was explicitly removed by the Americans is by the by. What matters is that there's this long history. And that then, that, that, that reinforces this perception that the Americans come in, do what they want, you know, remove who they want, you know, put into power who they want, obviously, via uh, their, their primary sort of go-between, which is the army. Um, and and that, that's why I think you have this groundswell of opinion, which is both anti-domestic elite and also anti-foreign elite. And, you know, for what it's worth, this is something that we have to pay attention to. It's another matter altogether that, you know, Pakistan, like so many other countries, is missing a progressive left that can tap into that sentiment. And that's why I think you have strong men like Khan acquiring so much popularity. And Asim, we just have a minute, but is it your sense, uh, of course, PTI supporters, uh, Imran Khan's party supporters, believe this about him, but was he really an anti-imperial president, a prime minister? Look, I mean, you know, for, for, from our perspective, to be anti-American or to be anti-Western is, is different from being anti-imperialist. And you asked earlier about what he did in power. I mean, in practice, you know, there were very few policy steps to change Pakistan's sort of foreign policy regime, its larger militarized sort of policy matrix. So, you know, I think for us, uh, the, the challenge for us on the left is how do we, you know, take this burgeoning sentiment amongst a young population and deepen it and in more progressive directions? Of course, that's a hard task, but I, I don't see any other way for us to break this cycle between a liberal center that keeps creating, paving the way for, you know, far-right figures to become popular and come to power. Asim Sajad Akhtar, associate professor at Qaeda Azam University in Islamabad, also affiliated with Pakistan's left-wing Awami Workers' Party. Thank you for joining us.
And that does it for our show. Democracy Now! is produced with Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Dina Guzder, Sharif Abdelkadus, Messiah Rhodes, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warnoff, Charina Nadura, Sam Alkoff, Tamari Astudio, John Hamilton, Rabbi Karen, Hani Masood, and Hannah Elias. Our executive director is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Hugh Grant, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, Dennis McCormick. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.